Hello everyone, how have you been? Please let me know, alright? And uh, today we're here to talk about three different species from the same, the same genus. The genus is Anoshetus, and we're going to be talking about Anoshetus Rishi, Graffae, and Subquecus, right? And uh, to start, let me give you a little bit of a backstory on this genus. This genus is all of it a genus of trap jaw ants, which means that they have those uh, mandibles that open. 180 degrees or even more in some cases and they snap shut very very fast and if they do that on the ground they can jump up high and it's basically the same as Odotomachus which is a very well known uh, genus but Anoshetus is usually very very small especially by comparison to Odotomachus they also usually have uh, bigger numbers uh, in colony size but not a lot and usually they have lighter colors but that's just you know the norm it's not the way to identify them. So, let's start off with Anoshetus rishi, which, which is, in my opinion, the most well-known species of the genus. Um, they are orange in color, and they are, you know, I'd say the, the one that people know about the most in the genus Anoshetus. They uh, hail from Indonesia and China, mainly, though they do exist a little bit all throughout other parts of the south southeastern uh, Asia. So, uh, when it comes to climate, they come from a very tropical uh, type of place, so they will want slightly higher than normal temperatures and humidity also is a big need. Uh, they do usually nest in very very discreet areas where you've got a lot of condensation in the zone where they're nesting, so you will want to have the nest pretty humid uh, and the outworld, you know, at least above 50%. If the outworld is not above 50%, they're going to be doing very, very badly because they really do need that humidity to be doing fine and work properly. So, the numbers I'd give you, and, you know, the use a gradient, you have probably somewhere either there or in the description a video to, uh, to my channel where I explain better how to actually create a gradient and let your ants thermo and hydro regulate for themselves. So, numbers. From 50 to 80 percent in humidity, uh, the best is that you don't go up above 50, you should probably aim for 70 something and probably 70, the low 70s. Uh, in the nest, of course, in the outworld it should be a little bit drier so they don't, so they know and differentiate nest from outworld. Though they will not uh, require a drier outworld than the nest if the, the, the outworld is, the outworld is uh, as humid as the nest will be just fine. Just know that they're very uh, sensitive to humidity is below 50%, so keep that in mind. When it comes to temperature, they also need pretty constant temperatures, but uh, they're not too hard to achieve. You should keep them between 21 and 30 degrees Celsius, though to, to have them thriving, I would recommend 22 to 26, keep them a little bit on the cooler side. They will not produce eggs as fast, but they will also not die as fast. So uh, the tw 24, 26 is and I found to be the sweet spot to have them grow uh, very, very fast. All other two species, both the Graffae and Subquecus, will follow these same numbers and this same sort of effect in gradient for their climate that you need to have for them. Uh, however, they do come from other different places. Subquecus comes from China and Taiwan, and um, Graffae comes a little bit all around the world. They, they are even known to be in Brazil, in South, South Africa, and but they are natural to uh, the Indo-Australian islands, which means Philippines and Indonesia. They've also been you know, introduced to uh, the, the, the northern parts of Australia. Uh, however, they are natural to this very tropical island uh, scenario, and so the temperature humidity they will need are exactly the same as I've said for uh, Rishi. Okay, now, talking about sizes, uh, the workers for, of both Rishi and Graffae are roughly, um, roughly 5 to 7 millimeters long. Uh, Graffae is a little bit darker in color, they're both orange-ish, uh, red orange-ish, something along those lines, depends also in localizations and um, all that. The queens of both these species as well are usually is anywhere from 7 millimeters to 8 millimeters. It, it can be a little bit hard to identify them. They are usually a, a, bit, a little bit darker than the workers, 
and they have an extended gas and the fight muscles in their thorax. Uh, but you know, until they start pumping out eggs and their gaster enlarges quite a bit, you won't be able to tell who the queen is from a simple glance. You have to actually pay very close attention to it to find the queen. Okay? Now, Subquecus is a lot smaller. They are not small enough to, that you have to worry about them fitting through cracks and anything. They are not capable of that. Their exoskeleton is very, very sturdy. They don't seem to be able to squish through places as well as other species of this size. They are from 2 to 4 millimeters, and even the smaller workers, which are very, very tiny, tiny. it's actually very cool to see such tiny trap jaw ants. Uh, they can't fit through uh, stuff that you wouldn't know that they would fit through, because the mandibles are very stiff, and all their exoskeleton in general is very robust. So they can sort of squish themselves, as well as other ant species, and other invertebrates for that matter. The queen of Subquecus is from 4 to 5 millimeters, she's also very small, but she's slightly bigger than the workers, more so than the other two species, she's easier to identify in a quick glance. Now when it comes to colony size, all three of these species are monogenous. There are cases of them being polygynous in the wild and probably in, in captivity. It does happen and it's under, it's under very strict conditions and uh, it's not normal. Uh, like most um, said to be monogenous species, they could be polygynous but they usually are not, okay? Now when it comes to numbers, they, I've, I've mentioned that they are a little bit bigger in colony size than Odontomachus, and they are. Uh, while Odontomachus stays anywhere between 1 and 200, uh, these guys usually go anywhere from 4 to 600, and even more in the wild. In captivity, they usually stay in between 400 and 500, 600, you know, rare cases, and you need very optimal conditions. They can go above that, but it's not usual. For a single queen to be able to sustain more than 600 workers of this species. When it comes to feeding, uh, other than the climate, which is uh, quite hard to maintain, uh, to maintain, I'd say that the, the difficulty with this species uh, is the climate, in fact. Uh, but the thing is that you want to watch them hunt, right? They're trap giants, they are very aggressive hunters, and they do hunt very well, it's very cool to watch them. If you, if you are an keeper and you want to keep them, you probably want to watch them hunt. The thing is that they're very small, especially subquecas. So, to watch them hunt, you have to feed them very, very small food, very, very small insects that are alive still. Like fruit flies, the smaller variety, especially for younger colonies, you'll need very, very small fruit flies. You can feed them chopped up insects and they'll eat off that just fine. But if you want to watch them hunt, keep in mind they cannot take down a mealworm, alright? They can probably kill it out of exhaustion if they are a big colony, but they'll not be able to process it at all because they won't be able to open it up. They're very, very small. They can't do that. Um, even though they have this very fast bite and this uh, very impressive mandibles, they cannot get through a mealworm. Maybe a baby mealworm, yeah, that, that's sure. But uh, it's hard to, to come around. So if you want to watch them hunt, do that. If you just want to feed them, cut open the insects and they'll be just fine, just like any other ant. It's just a little note. Also, they eat fruits and sugars, they're not too keen on that, they're very protein heavy uh, intakers and they'll eat protein like crazy for a small species and for small ants, you know. Um, also, they can't really create repletes very well, they, they can't keep storage of food in their nests very well at all, so you should probably be fine with a week, week and a half, but I would consider two weeks to be a little bit too long to leave them without food. Uh, if, you leave the, if you leave for two weeks in a vacation or something and you leave them protein jelly, they will probably be fine until the end of the two weeks. However, if you're going to be away for more than two weeks, pay attention because uh, if, they, if they go without food for too long, they might not die all at once, they might not collapse just then, but it will send them in a path of collapsion and they will eventually fall out of, uh, of order and they'll stop having new eggs and all the all the, the colony will fall apart. So, pay close attention to those things, they are amazing. I consider them to be the only genus of ants that is actually cute. I love ants, but they're not a cute animal. Uh, Anoshetus, at least seen from a human eye perspective, not too up close, that's absolutely terrifying. They are very cute, you know, when they have those little mandibles close to like that, it's actually pretty cool to see. So, 
I would recommend them to anyone that thinks they're capable of maintaining this stability that they need and give them what they need to thrive. If you can do that, keep them, it'll be amazing, all right? They are definitely not a species for beginner. Uh, I'd say they're species for experts, semi-expert level or something along those lines. But they are awesome and they are a very cool ant species. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Ay, 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 ay.